Welcome to the Published Author Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs learn how to write a book and leverage it to grow their business and make an impact. I'm your host, Josh Steinle. Today, my guest is Drew Neiser. Drew is the founder of Renegade, an award-winning B2B branding boutique. He also started CMO Huddles, the fastest growing membership community exclusively for B2B CMOs. Drew's second book, Renegade Marketing, 12 Steps to Building Unbeatable B2B Brands, launches October 5th. Drew has helped dozens of CMOs unleash their inner renegade and told the stories of more than 450 marketers via his podcast, Renegade Thinkers Unite. Drew writes for Ad Age and has had articles published in Fast Company and Forbes. Drew, welcome to the show. Hey, Josh. It's so great to be here. It is fun to reconnect. Drew and I first met at the content marketing conference. Uh, I can't remember where that one was hosted. Maybe that was in Las Vegas. Maybe it was in Boston. But I know it was at that event that we first met in person. And I was familiar with your book, The Periodic Table of... Wait, you give the title. The CMO's Periodic Table. No worries. (laughs) The CMO's Periodic Table, which I was very interested in because I was also working on my first book, which happened to be a book targeting CMOs. And so, and there weren't that many books out there for CMOs or about CMOs. Yours was one of the few ones. So that's how I got connected there. And when I saw you at the event, I was like, I got to talk to Drew because he knows about CMO books. So that's how we got started. But here I am telling your story. Let's have you tell your story a little bit, Drew. Who are you? Where'd you come from? And what do you do? (laughs) Uh, So I was thinking about your episode with uh, Les McEwen, and he describes the seven stages, if you will. Uh, And I feel like I've been, as I was listening to that show, been through all of them. But I'm going to fast forward in my career. and We'll go back. So 2008 was kind of a pivotal year and helps explain sort of everything that's happened in the last 13 years for me. So I'd been an agency guy for a long, long time. I had started Dense, uh, Renegade with Dentsu way back in 93. But in 2008, I made the genius decision to buy Dentsu out. And my rationale is going to buy them out because a huge percentage of our business was Japanese. That business was going to be leaving and there wasn't really a basis for the relationship. So I closed October 31st, 2008. So you may remember that was the start of the worst recession since 1929. Add on top of the fact that 70% of our business walked out the door with a, a in the name of Panasonic, which had been, we'd had them for 15 years. So we doubled the average, but anyway, We also got stiffed a half a million dollars from a client who had lost money in the Madoff scandal. So you take those three, and this is an agency, we had as many as 100 people a a year or two before. We also had about $10 million in non-recurring revenue coming through the agency. So we were, you know, it was like, and then all this happened and we had to scale down incredibly, incredibly quickly. And I didn't know if we would survive. So there were a couple of things in the survival strategy that will get to this book that are really important. So one was we got to focus and we're going to have to focus on both what we do and who we do it for. And two, we're going to have to make as many friends as we possibly can. And so that's when I started writing And I started and I made a commitment in 2008. I was going to interview at least somebody and write an article every single week for 52 weeks and create a body of work of somehow. So we did focus the agency. We went from this sort of full service with a really strong emphasis to gorilla to just social media for a short period of time. And that was that survival helped us. And then from there, we gradually morphed into a B2B boutique that you introduced us as. But it was the writing that really sort of helped create this path. We did make a lot of friends. Those friends, some of those became clients. And that 100 interviews, eventually, after a two-year period, someone said, hey, Drew, you've interviewed 100 CMOs. There must be a book in there. And that's how I got to my first book. Um, And it wasn't like, oh, I should write a book. It's just, oh, there's 100 interviews. There's got to be a book. And, and I, it's important. We should talk about that because your motivation for writing a book is really important. Yeah, I, I love it when that type of stuff happens, when you're like, you know what? I've already got this content sitting right here. I could turn this into a book. There's a book right there. And that can trick you sometimes because you think, oh, yeah, I'll just turn that into a book. And then you realize it's a lot of work even to turn existing content into a book. But 
Tell us a little bit more about how that process unfolded then with that content that you had there and you said, okay, I'm going to turn this into a book. What was the turning point to say, I'm really going to do this? Yeah, it was sort of like I looked at the articles and I started to think about the topics that we covered. And and I that's one of the sort of the periodic table idea, because that was that's a nice framework. And I th- sort of said, oh, OK, well, we're going to have 64 elements. And these are the sort of the basic elements that every CMO needs to have. And then we're going to go all the way through the periodic table to these sort of crazy things that great CMOs do on the far right of the table. And I had about I would say 55 of the 64 interviews were done. And I went back to each of them. I had to go back to every single one of them because I hadn't planned ahead and gotten permission, which I did after that. So I had to go back to every single one. I have to get every single quote approved. Um, We sort of rewrote it to help make them a little more focused. And I finished this book. Uh, It took me a year and a half. I never stopped working. This was just something I did on the weekends and nights. And I got the book done. Again, this is not the way most people do it. And then I said, oh, you know, a lot of these are really senior CMOs. I mean, I got the CMO of Visa and I got the CMO of GE and they're, they probably want me to have a real publisher. So finished book, actually, not only finished book, laid out finished book, because I had one of our uh, creative directors laid out and we shopped it as a finished book. And sure enough, Pearson, a division of Pearson said, oh, this is really good. We like it. We'll support it. It feels like it might have a really good educational market and they're big in the educational market. So, you know, somewhere, I think November, 2015, it goes to market. Two weeks later, they closed that division of Pearson. (laughs) (laughs) Man, so you've you've got a good uh, sense of timing. I do. I mean, you know, the the whole thing. uh, So. There were so many lessons learned, but I think the biggest lesson I learned from that book is, you know, just because you have content doesn't mean you should write a book. You should write a book to solve a problem. And I think the first book solved a problem for a certain type of marketer who said, you know, marketing's challenging. There are a lot of elements. Tell me what they all are and I'll figure out what the right mix is. And that's a, that's a certain group of people. But in the second book, what I said was, I'm going to do the opposite. I want to solve, I want to tell you what to do. And it's going to be Drew based on all those interviews, take some of the wisdom that I've earned and and solve a problem. And that problem is that B2B marketing has gotten ridiculously complicated, but not more effective. Now, there's a whole story in how I got to the second book, but I'll take a break there for a second because there's a lot to digest there in I think, because I was listening to some of your other authors and they all had really good reasons. I don't think I had as good a reason to write my first book other than get a book out. Well, this is interesting because this is the conundrum of having existing content is you can get into a spot where you say, I've got this content, I should do something with it. And yet, if you were going to go back and say, I have no content, what book should I write? It might not be that book. And so where do you want to spend your time? Do you want to spend your time on the book that you say, well, I'm going to publish it because I've got the content sitting here. Or do you want to focus your time on I'm writing the book that I should write? With my first book, Chief Marketing Officers at Work, it was a little bit similar in that I had an idea for the book I wanted to write, which was more like a digital marketing for the CMO type of book. Right. But then when I started writing it, I realized I don't really know anything about CMOs. (laughs) And... Then this opportunity came along to write this book, CMOs at Work. And I thought, well, what a great way to get to know CMOs. I can go interview a bunch of them and put it together in this book. And then I'll know CMOs. And then I can go write the book that I really want to write. Problem is I wrote the first book and I never wrote the second book. I never got around to it. Right. And so that was, I kind of got trapped a little bit in there. And I always tell people, I'm like, the first book I wrote was not the book I should have written. It was great. It was a great experience. I enjoyed it. But it wasn't the book I wanted to write, nor the book I should have written for my business. Yeah. It was great, but yeah. And we're exactly the same place in that one. And I really, what it was is what's the shortest distance to a book that I took that, but not necessarily what's the shortest distance to a book that will help our business or a book that I want to write, pick one. Um, and it's funny because we had been very close in uh, around that period of time, there was a, a, a woman I knew 
who was an expert in certain aspects of B2B marketing. And we actually pitched Wiley on B2B marketing for dummies and they were ready to go with our proposal. And then we realized neither of us wanted to write B2B for dummies. And so we backed away from that. And that was sort of what, okay, well, I'm not going to write that one. I better get another one out there. And so that's what pushed me to um, the CMO's periodic table. But I, I, I got to say, I learned so much. And one of the things that came, this is what's really interesting. So you write the book and then you have to go speak about it. And people kept saying to me, Drew, 64, we can't deal with 64. Narrow it down. What are the characteristics of a successful CMO? And that's when it came up with the CATS framework and, and started speaking about that. And I would use examples from the previous book, but in this book, the CATS framework of courageous, artful, thoughtful, and scientific, it is the, it's what holds the book together. And so there is continuity from one book. So, you know, sometimes you just have to do stuff to get the experience. And, and I think that's what the first book really did for me. Yeah. Several years ago, many years ago, I had the opportunity to interview David Neilman, who founded JetBlue. And I asked him this question, hey, if for the young college student, which I was at the time, I was really asking for myself, I said, for the young college student who wants to be an entrepreneur, like, but doesn't really know anything, what's your advice? And he said, jump into something and get dirty. Doesn't even matter what it is. Jump into something and get dirty. And then you'll figure out something you can do there that will lead you to somewhere else. It feels similar with a book that right. there is something to be said for just jumping in and writing something, almost anything, because maybe you'll finish that book. Maybe you won't, but no matter what, you're going to learn a lot. Yeah. I mean, you just can't get paralyzed by fear. You got to do it. It's funny. I met David Needleman on a JetBlue flight, and this was an incredible oh, really? experience. And I'm going I'm to go there because the story is so unbelievable. He goes every seat and talks to everybody. He talks to me and he says, hey, so, um, you know, what's your name? I said, oh, Drew. And I and said, so, what are you going to ski? I said, yes. And when, when were, have you been here before? I said, yeah, I was there in 2002 um, and I, I broke my shoulder at the Olympics. So, you know, was a, it was an interesting thing. So two hours later, we're getting off the plane and David and he's saying goodbye to everybody. He said, Drew, be careful out there. I mean, he remembered my name. He remembered the conversation. I mean, he's just sort of one of these unique individuals who, you know, is, yeah, you got to go in and get dirty, but it doesn't hurt if you're just a brilliant guy who really has a great deal of empathy with people. Yep. Yep. That's a great story. <laughs> cool. So talk to us then. So in between your first book coming out, the periodic chart, or right, table. <laughs> it's hard for me to table. remember this title for some reason. I keep wanting I, uh, to reverse well, it. Yeah, there you go. Um, but in between your first book and your second book, right? Were you when you finished the first book? Did you already know you were going to write the second book? Did you have an inkling that you know what? There's something else I want to do, or how did it come about that you realized there's a second book here that I need to write? So I, in my mind, I always knew I was going to write three books, and I knew what the third book was. And that book, by the way, I still haven't written, and that's the book that I really want to write. <laughs> but it's because it's on Ben Franklin, and it's a whole goofy other thing that I think will be really fun for middle, you know, kids. But it's just a completely offshoot; it has nothing to do with business. So this book sort of evolved in a in a kind of an interesting way. So. I kept interviewing. I never stopped interviewing. I'm over 450. I think I'm closer to 500 now in CMOs. And I just kept doing those interviews and kept learning. At the same time, our business, we made another pivot maybe five years ago where we said, all right, social, I don't like what's, where social is going as a service pretty much. I, I don't want to just do that. We're way too far down the chain. Let's move up strategy. So we started moving up to strategy and brand. And they said, okay, and I don't want to do this for everybody. Let's just focus on B2B. So we made a pivot four to five years ago, and I made a pivot in my interviews. So I just started interviewing B2B CMOs and started to interview them. And of course, I had started the podcast uh, five years ago to, to sort of get more value out of all of that. And by the way, every time you sign up for a podcast interview with me, I make you sign a release that says, I'm going to write a book with your material. So let me know if you have a problem with that. <laughs> anyway, so all those B2B interviews were happening. And at the same time, we were meeting with clients and it was clear to me that there was something broken out there. 
And, and so, and I wasn't sure exactly how to solve the problem, but I thought we could. And so we identified this problem that B2B marketing had gotten incredibly complicated. So I said, all right, well, what's the simplest way to do this? Let's map out a different process. And we mapped out a process and we said, okay, 12 steps. Great. And then I started to talk to CMOs in small groups through like the CMO club. And I shared the outline of it and shared some things and that started to resonate. So I said, okay, so come along 2019, I started writing the book said, with these 12 steps. And I started and I continued to talk to CMO was about it, continued to interview to get more fodder to support it. Um, and then I was done or close to done with the book in March of 2020. <laughs> right? Pandemic starts. And I say, I don't know if this is a pandemic proof book. So I stopped, put the book on hold, took the 45,000 words that we had, stripped it down to 15,000 words, created the mother of all blog posts, which is on our website, renegade.com. You'll find it sort of 12 branding things, and it's there. Immediately, that became a really hot thing. We get 400 visitors every single day from Google reading that thing. And so there was a lot of validation to that. And then earlier this year, I said, okay, been through, this been through the pandemic. We've seen what needs to be adjusted. Marketing is still marketing. There's principles apply. The formula still works. We've applied it to clients, finished the damn book. And by the way, I'd already done another 50 interviews that could sharpen it even more. So that's where we get to, that's how we get to Renegade Marketing, which is um, really now four years worth of work and refinement uh, into trying to solve this challenge of ridiculously simplifying B2B marketing. Quick break here. Are you an entrepreneur? Do you want to write a book that will help you grow your business? Visit publishedauthor.com where we have programs to fit every budget, programs that will help you write and publish your book in as little as 90 days, starting at just $39 per month. Or if you're too busy to write your book, we'll interview you and then write and publish your book for you. Don't let the valuable knowledge and experience you have go to waste. Head on over to publishedauthor.com to get the help you need to become a published author. You've already waited long enough. Do it today. Now, back to the show. So um, so you, you can't see this, but it says this book was published by CMO Huddles. Okay. Uh-huh. And the idea was that as we build up this community of, of marketers, some of them are going to say, Drew, what's the story with the book? Can you do that? Why'd you publish it? And I intend to, if that conversation happened, to outsource that all of it. <laughs> but I, do, I mean, I, I, on the other hand, I do think also I can help them at least get them started yeah. and give them a framework for thinking about how to get this done. Uh, but ultimately, uh, so I do want to know about your service and how that works. And I worked with Girl Friday, who I thought was excellent. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm imagining you do something similar to what they do. Yeah. If you know Girl Friday or, or if you know Scribe that uh, Tucker Max started, right. that's what we do. There are a lot of others out there and there's a lot of great ones. Uh I would say that the primary difference between us and other services out there is we do focus exclusively on entrepreneurs writing nonfiction books that they can leverage to grow their business. Got and it. so we're very focused that way. So if somebody comes to us and says, Hey, I had a great 50 year career in business. I'd love to write a memoir. Yeah. We're not, yeah. we're not the right fit for that. Right. But if it's an entrepreneur saying, I want to write a book about my area of expertise, and I'm hoping this is a great marketing tool that I can use as the business card for my business, that's our sweet spot. All right. Yeah. Okay. So may, may, not too many. Most of my CMOs are not entrepreneurs. I will. Yeah. I mean, it works right for away. executive too, right. um, but it's, it's writing a nonfiction book that you can leverage. And we market right. it towards entrepreneurs, but I mean, if a CEO, CMO comes in and says, Hey, I want to write a book to build my personal brand. Yeah, right. that would be a, that would be a perfect fit. It's just some of the language we use isn't going to match up with them because we're talking about entrepreneurs all the time. But if they follow right. the steps, it's the same steps right. that it. they would need to follow anyway. 
Got it. Cool. So I really want to dig into this process a little bit of testing out content before writing the book, because I think that's so key for a lot of, especially first time authors, but really any author, it makes so much sense to test things out before you write it because you can write such a better book. Can you talk to that a little bit more? Sure. So, um, I had the outline and I knew, and when I, when I went to speak on it, I had three examples from interviews that I'd done for all 12 steps. And I sort of watched the, this group. I was talking to say 15 to 20 CMOs at dinners. And I probably, it was like a road show. And we did like six of those. And I could see what resonated. I could see, and I could go back to each of them and say, what'd you take away? What was interesting to you? Which part of this resonated more? Where do we need more work? Um, and when we put it out, and by the way, I had to go, there were certain areas of the book where I was really uncertain if I was on solid ground, like metrics, getting metrics right, or automating, uh, attentively when it comes to MarTech. So I had to do a lot of extra work in that area. Um, because the strategy work was like a no brainer. That was the easy part of, of the book. So I think the big test was this 15,000 word blog post. I mean, if it, who's going to spend, it could take you 45 minutes to read that. People do. And so that to me, if you're going to spend 45 minutes with it and lots of folks, then they'd read it and they go, I want to download this. I want to share this. Uh, And the fact that, you know, it also helped Renegade be ranked on the first page of B2B branding is not a bad thing either, but it was more the validation of the content uh, and it really helped. And also, as I kept reading that, I would see where the weaknesses were and I could get some feedback on that. And then so we'd do another interview and go talk to another CMO about it. And since I'm interviewing at least one CMO a week, I knew that I could guide the interviews to help this time, unlike with the periodic table where it was like, take the interviews and try to make a book, it was now use the interviews to inform the book. Well, that's great. It's interesting how people say, oh, we live in this society now or culture where it's all about short attention spans. You got to get your message across quick. And yet here you are putting out long form content that takes a ton of time to read. Why do you think people, number one, do you think people are right about the short attention spans? Number two, why did people gravitate towards this long post that obviously was long? They could tell right. it was long before they got into it. Right. And by the way, in the first paragraph, I warn people, it's a really long article. If you want the one pager, you know, click here. Now, the one pager, this is to me completely useless, but lots of people wanted it because they thought, oh, there's the, you know, there's the 15 second version of this. But I look at this and go, I don't know how I would implement with this little one pager, but it's fast. So I think that when you're trying to tackle something really, really big, like B2B brand strategy and how to structure as a, as a CMO, how you go about doing business, um, you know, a 500 word blog post or a seven second video isn't going to get the job done. It's not. And, and so, you know, I, I think you just have to, I'm not saying you don't do snippets and you don't do, but if you've got something meaningful that, that really is well thought through, put it out there because, you know, the 500 word blog post, when was the last time you said, I'm going to change the way I do business because of this 500 word blog post. I mean, that's what we're trying to do. You know, we, I, this is about building a a community of renegade marketers and I can't do that in 500 words or a thousand words. So do you think the idea that we're a short-term attention society. Do you think that's correct or incorrect? Or what do you think's behind that? I think it is correct for a large swath of content. On the other hand, during the pandemic, readership of books went way up, right? People are watching long form shows. They're watching, you know, they might binge on it, but they're hour long episodes. It's not like every piece of television content is five minutes. Um, I don't think people are given credit for um, their ability to read and absorb really good information. Now, you, we could all be Jim Patterson and write three-page chapters, <laughs> right? That would, would help. But 
Uh, and that, by the way, was one of the advantages of my first book was that it was really short chapters. So you could, it was bite-sized things. I don't think it's as, um, if you want to solve complicated problems and you want to give frameworks, you need more time. And so, look, I think people will invest the time if it's worth it. I do. Don't you? I mean, you read books. Yeah. Well, and you look at the popularity. I mean, Joe Rogan, most popular podcaster in the world. His episodes are two or three hours long. Yeah. And Tim Ferriss, another big one. His episodes are two hours long. And you look at Harry Potter, which that's a couple of years ago, but still right. like, I mean, that's a bunch of kids reading thousands of pages of a book. And so when people say, oh, we all have short attention spans, I'm like, I don't know. Do we have short attention spans or do we just have a lot of content that isn't worth paying attention to? Yeah. I mean, I, we think about that a lot and, and there's so much content out there. And if you want to have, if you want to stand out, if you want to get ranked in Google, you're not going to get ranked for a 500 word blog post. It's just not going to happen. You're not going to get authority from that. Um, but I was also thinking, I don't know if you're a fan of Dan Carlin, hardcore history. Oh yeah. Has, yeah. Love it. They're like four hours per episode. <laughs> Some of them are six hours. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, once I go down one of his rabbit holes, it's like I'm coming up 24 hours later. <laughs> yeah. And then you want more. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they're so good. That's yeah. the key. It is really about quality, you know, and that's the thing. And, you know, if you can write a book and it's interesting enough and I've had fun lately, I recorded the audio version of it. By the way, I want to mention that. So I encourage everybody to record their audio book, but not necessarily use their own audio re reading. <laughs> and the reason is you will find every typo and you will find that one sentence or two sentences that you thought, oh, that's not quite right. That your proofer will miss, your editor will miss because the audio guy who recorded my book said he's never had a recording that didn't find a typo. <laughs> I believe Which, it. Right. But by the way, it is so hard. That was much harder than writing the book. Reading it. I was reading it. Yeah, I have so much respect for the uh, people who do the voice talent and such. I just think, oh man, what a yeah unforgiving task. And my my new book's coming out in October too. And I'm like, oh, I got to record the audio book for this. How am I ever going to make it through this whole book? It's going to be such a nightmare. But at the same time, how do you feel about the author reading a book versus hiring somebody else to read it for them. So here's the th reason why I decided to do it is if you're a podcaster and you have an audience that follows you and likes you, I think it's really disconcerting to hear someone else's voice. And so that was the way I made the decision. And, you know, I also met with a audio producer and I said, can we read a paragraph or two? And can you honestly tell me whether I'm going to be good enough at this? Um, but you have a good voice and your audience likes you. Uh, I, you know, here's the thing. I don't know how many words your book is like 45,000, something like that, maybe more average length. Yeah. Okay. So that's nine hours of work, six hour and a half sessions. And then there's another, say, five minutes of, of outtakes where you have to re-record certain things. Um, it's not that bad. And uh, you just, it's- <laughs> For some people, I, that sounds like a nightmare. They're like, I got to record six hours. Oh, but yeah. But, you know, your, your producer is there following every word, making sure you're reading it, um, you know, and, and you're sort of, but it was another chance to read your own book. And I was, it, what was fun for me, and this is a weird thing to say, is I- that's a good story. That was a good sentence. I'm proud of that. And so I really felt like when I was done, I felt like I had done something that it was very reaffirming. And, you know, of course, this is what the all audio producers said, but, you know, he said I was taking notes and I learned a lot. So cool. So were you editing your manuscript as you did the recording? Like, were you making changes and saying, I mean, or was it no, too late? I, no, it's too late at that stage. I mean, presumably you've already, it's been edited and, you know, you've gone through copy development, you've had a proof or read every single page and you've gone back and forth on, you know, is it 12, uh, number 12 or 12 written out, that kind of thing. And, you know, stylistic things that you might disagree on with your proof or when you get to the audio book, you have this. As you'll see on page 10, you'll have to say, as you heard from, 
you know, from page 10, or you'll have these little things. But you, if you want to have this thing that, uh, that uh, the ebook reader that Amazon has if, on Kindle, if you want to have this match thing, which you can do where you can listen to it or read it in the same time, you have to read almost exactly word for word. So the only time, and this is the, there were like, we found five typos and we found two sentences that just didn't make any sense to me. And we rewrote them on the fly in the audio. And fortunately there was time to get them changed in the, the physical copies. I mean, we literally were out to press on the first press proofs when I said, nope, don't do that. <laughs> so, that's but that's a huge advantage. I mean, I, yeah. I, you know, cause you, as careful as a proofer is and as careful as you are, you also have this urgency to get it done. You're going to yeah. miss it. Yeah. It's, it's impossible not to make mistakes. I mean, I've been reading the news for 20 years online and I'm amazed how often I read a CNN article or New York times and I find a typo in there. And I think, don't they have like three or four editors that this went through before it was published live? And yet here's it's, an obvious typo. It, we all do it. Yeah. I find, I found another, by the way, I did find a minor typo in, in my book, in the physical copy just yesterday. So it's, it's all of them say chapter lowercase C, but one of them says uppercase C. <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead and find that in the book and sue me. Um, but uh, hopefully, you know, I think the other thing I was thinking about as we're talking about other young, young authors trying to get the, there's no perfect book. I already know where I want to rewrite the book and I hope that I'll get to Renegade Marketing 2 and it'll be an evolved and improved edition. And I'm continuing to think about that as you just get, you learn more every time, right? So finish the book, start it and finish it and get it out there. Yeah. Uh, Done is know. better than perfect. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I'm curious, did you record right there in it? in the studio setup you have there, or did you go into a professional studio to record or? So I went in, so this, this is actually And, and for, for those of, for those who are listening to this, you should go over to YouTube and then you can actually see what we're talking right. about. But Drew's got a pretty nice audio setup going in uh, his home office there, it looks like. So, yeah. I mean, I got this Heil mic and I've got a mixer in the background and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty good quality. Uh, but for the audiobook, he uses uh, or that the, they use this thing, Squid FM, and it uh, he's listening at such an intense level. And this was in the middle of the summer. I had to turn. Not only did I have to turn the air conditioner off and keep the windows closed and close the blinds, I had to unplug my refrigerator. That I have a little uh, office fridge in here because he could hear the humming of that. He could, he could pick that up. That's amazing. He, so even though and my rig didn't change, uh, and the one thing I had to do was I had to have a headset on, not this, just some kind of earpiece so that it wasn't, the sound wasn't coming out of the mic because he's that sensitive. He'll get a feedback loop. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Um, I'm in Arizona and it's summer. I don't think I'm turning off the air conditioning in my house when I do my recording though. <laughs> well, if you have a studio where you can do it in the air, condi my air condition is a little loud and, and, uh, I know it was hot. Yeah. Yeah. The good news uh, is it wasn't video. So, you know, you could turn the lights out, you could wear a t-shirt and, you know, that's true. At least you can sweat it out and nobody will. Exactly. See. <laughs> exactly. So the book's coming out October 5th, which as of this recording is just a few weeks from now, what are some of your launch plans? How are you going to get the word out about this book? Or have you built well, a platform? Do you have an audience ready to go? So there's a, a lot of things going on. Um, I would say I'm a little bit of a cobbler's children here. I'm a marketer and so forth, but I've got three businesses at, I look at right now. I've got Renegade. We also started something called CMO Huddles in April of last year. And then there's the book. So these things do come together and I do have a platform in the podcast, uh, which is great. and. Uh, big sizable newsletter audience that I built up over the last 10 years and a big social audience that I built up over the last 10 years. And there's these pieces come together and, and I'll explain that in a minute. And I'm doing a lot of podcasts and there's already been an article on Inc 
magazine where my book was ranked number two behind Dory, uh, Dory Clark's latest book, which was very nice. And there will be a lot more articles and reviews because that made a big difference last time too. Um, a little bit of paid media to sort of provide a little halo effect uh, against a very targeted group of people. We built up a pretty big database of B2B chief marketing officers. And the one thing that this book is focused on is B2B. And if you look for B2B branding books, it's really hard to find. There are books out there. Uh, and I, you know, I, Raja or Raja Manar, who wrote, you know, Quantum Marketing, which is a really interesting book. He's got one paragraph on B2B. Not one paragraph, one chapter. And, and, and so I feel like B2B is often overlooked as this sort of stepchild. So I feel like between that, so if from, going back from a marketing standpoint, uh, podcasts, advertising, social, direct. Got it. And so what are you hoping happens with the book when it comes out? I mean, how are you going to leverage this to grow your business? Is it hey, I want this to bring a lot of people to me that have never heard of me before. Do I want to generate more credibility with the audience that I already have, uh, all of the above and more? Tell us a little bit about what results you're hoping to see from it. Yeah, so last time the book and speaking engagement sort of went hand in hand and I went on a big speaking tour and obviously I'm not doing that with this book um, and that sold a lot of books and so I'm, it's not, I'm not necessarily looking to sell a huge quantity of books, but there is a group of people. There are 4,000 B2B CMOs out there and they all have people working for them. And that group of people, I do hope will, will read the book. And I also hope one of the things that we're offering that's Kind of unique. The hardcover is not available on Amazon. The hardcover is only available from me for $333. Why? Because <laughs> it comes with a consulting package. And so oh. my thought is you read the book, you you write the you write your purpose-driven story statement, you write your plan on a page, and you say, I want to talk to Drew about it. Boom, book it. It's on the website. So consulting will happen. There will be some halo effect for Renegade. I have no doubt about it. But the sort of interesting coexistence here is this community that we built called CMO Huddles. And this is a community of B2B CMOs who are members, the paid subscription. Um, we started about with 20 subscribers in October. We have 85 as of today. Um, and this community is helping each other, as I like to say, share care and dare each other to greatness. That's what's going on. And I think my book's going to play a part in that. S several of the CMOs that were in huddles were featured in the book. And so there's a synergy here. And what I really expect to happen is, you know, that I'll get feedback from these CMOs in the huddles and they'll say, you know, I'm not sure I tried this. It didn't work as well as I thought. I want to do this. Where's this framework? And I think it's going to be sort of uh, an underpinning and a structural thing. So what happens next? Is there a course? I hope so. Uh, is there consulting that will come out of this? Yes. And it already has. Um, and, and so Drew as, you know, in my agency doing certain things that we talk about in the book, great, but there's a little bit more, I'm more interested in developing a, a bunch of people out there who know how to do renegade marketing and then sort of just advising as needed, as opposed to where we've been before, where you hired Renegade to do this. Uh, and that's the hope is that there's this, you know, a kind of a movement. That's great. Some interesting marketing and leveraging ideas there. And you mentioned that you're already getting consulting work from the book and the book's not even out yet. And I think this is one of the unseen benefits of, or at least unanticipated benefits of being a first time author is, you can turn that book into attention before you even have the book published. Yeah, it's it's true. I you know I'm a little bit behind. I was listening to Chris Foss and I was listening to Douglas Burdett talking about you know getting a book six months in advance. You know I sent my copy to him a month in advance. Sorry, <laughs> I 
just it's sometimes you can't do everything perfect. You just got to keep moving. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, my book's coming out October 11th and I'm still working on it and it's getting oh. edited right now. And like, I know it's going to be down to the line and I kind of got pushed into a situation. So it has to come out October 11th. There's nothing I can really do about that unless right. I want to lose a lot of money for a marketing right. program I already paid for a long time ago. So it was like, well, this is what has to happen and that's what it is. Yeah. I'm going to do the best I can with it. And so be it. But, you know, I really learned from from Chris Foss's thing is he markets that book and is still doing it four years from now. Right. Yeah. Four years from there. And I think that's a really what a great lesson that was. It's like this is if you're and his is very tight and, and such a great book besides that. But the from the book to the consulting and and, you know, I can see how why, why that's been so successful. And so I think you just have to commit that this is a four year project. Exactly. If you write a great book, then you've got plenty of time to market it. It doesn't yeah. you don't have to have the perfect launch plan or else all is lost because a great book's going to be a great book now or in a year or two years or three years. Yeah. And and look, I I already by defining this as B2B brand strategy and B2B, I are, there's no way it could be a bestseller. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Your so, ex expectations are already tempered. Right. But I do think that it can be within its universe. It can be really, it's going to be, you know, I, I hope it'll be a book that will get people to pause and say, wait, are we doing this backwards? We're targeting customer prospects than customers and employees. Why shouldn't, and what I say in the book is, and there's some renegade thinking in there, right? not surprising. Marketers have it wrong. They are targeting the wrong group first. And so that's a really interesting thing to throw out in the marketplace. And saying, you're complicating your message. Why are you doing that? Tell me your message in eight words or less. Those are things that should stir up conversation. Are there any other tips directly from your book that might be applicable to the author entrepreneurs out there listening to this? Tips that they could use out of your book, not just from the book experience, but from the book itself? Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, one is... Um, I think it's really important that you as an individual can sort of articulate the book in eight words or less. <laughs> and obviously you have a title to do that, but a title doesn't always do it. Hopefully the subhead will do it, but really think about that in terms of purpose and how that connects back to you, right? And this gets back to the difference between for me, book one and book two. I am purposely connected to this book here. I mean, with my very soul, and I believe that there is a need and that, that, that it solves a problem. So that's what marketing does too. It, you know, helps solve a problem. And I, everything in the book is about clearing away the clutter and say, who do you really need to talk to? Because I think sometimes in, in you write a book and you say, who's this for? Think about that day one, not at the end, right? I don't know who will like that. Well, you know, that's, that's a problem. Focus is your friend. And, and I think, Clearing away the clutter, which is sort of the chapter number one, anybody could benefit from, you know, Marie Kondo, your plan, folks. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Drew, thanks so much for being with us here today. If people want to reach out and connect with you, learn more about the book, where's the best place for them to go? Well, let's see. They could go to renegade.com and or they could go to renegademarketing.com, which is the book website. Uh, renegade.com has got the short the all sorts of things. And then renegademarketing.com has anything related to the book. Perfect. And Thanks by so the much. way, they should connect with me on LinkedIn. Yes, for sure. All right, Drew. It's been great. Thank you so much for being with us here today on the podcast. Josh, thank you so much for having me. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to spread the word, please give us a five-star rating review and tell your friends to subscribe too. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you're an entrepreneur interested in writing and publishing a nonfiction book to grow your business and make an impact, visit publishedauthor.com for show notes for this podcast and other free resources. 